Welcome to Strictly Facts, a guide to Caribbean history and culture, hosted by me, Alexandria Miller. Strictly Facts teaches the history, politics, and activism of the Caribbean and connects these themes to contemporary music and popular culture. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Strictly Facts, a guide to Caribbean history and culture. We are in the month of August, which for the Anglophone Caribbean in particular means holidays or days of commemoration like Emancipation Day, which celebrates the day the Slavery Abolition Act went into effect in 1834 on August 1st, marking the end of slavery in the British Empire. August also means some carnival and festival holidays like carnival celebrations in Antigua and Barbuda, Um, and Kadunment Day in Barbados, which we learned about from our most recent episode with Shauna Ringod. In addition, August is also a landmark month for the Anglophone Caribbean nationalist movement, with Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago being the first to gain independence from Britain on August 6th and August 31st, 1962. So happy 59th independence to both nations when it comes. In any event, before Jamaica and Trinidad and several other islands became independent, there was a move to make them a single unified state known as the West Indian Federation. Here with us today to talk about the history of the West Indian Federation and Caribbean political unity then and now, we're joined today by one of my amazing professors, Dr. Patsy Lewis, Director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies and Senior Fellow at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. Dr. Lewis, thank you so much for joining us today. I will turn it over to you a bit to tell us more about yourself, where in the Caribbean is home for you, what you do, and how you got interested in that work. Hello, Alexandria. I am from Grenada, and I became interested in the Caribbean as a regional study and regional integration in particular, when um, actually it probably started with the Grenada invasion uh, in 1983, and the failure of CARICOM to put together a united front to try to find a regional solution to the Grenada problem at the time, and the failure of which led to the U.S. intervening. And the role of the Eastern Caribbean states was particularly intriguing to me because the invasion was, the attempt to legitimize it to the United Nations was under Article 8 of that treaty, which, according to the proponents, gave the OECS states the right to not only intervene in Grenada's internal affairs, but to invite external intervention. I did my master's some years after the invasion at Cambridge University, And the thesis, my master's thesis, was to look at how credible that argument was on the international law. My conclusion was that it had no validity. And the majority of the international community had decided that before me by rejecting that argument. So moving from the OECS, it was almost a natural progression to move more deeply into looking at um, that part of the Caribbean, the Eastern Caribbean. And I went on to do my PhD um, thesis at Cambridge on the failed political union initiative that was attempted in the mid to late 80s to unite the Windward Islands and the Leeward Islands, the members of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States into a political union. So that's, that's where my journey, and then since then, I've been looking at CARICOM, um, thinking largely how CARICOM could play a bigger role in strengthening or, or shoring up the region's already very fragile sovereignty and how it can become a place that 
you know, more meets the aspirations for belonging of ordinary Caribbean people. So that has been the thrust of my interest and work in regional integration. Well, Dr. Lewis, I'll definitely want to have you back on another episode to talk about the Grenadian Revolution. I think that's another history that, you know, we definitely maybe don't talk about as much as far as Caribbean political movements go. But, um, you know, talking about that history with Maurice Bishop's leadership, et cetera, um, is definitely another conversation that we will definitely be having on Strictly Facts. Um, so turning more specifically to the West Indian Federation and Caribbean unity, as I mentioned, the West Indian Federation was an attempted political union of some of the British West Indies. This included then territories Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Dominica, Grenada, Jamaica, um, what was then St. Christopher Nevis and Anguilla, um, which then, you know, became um, St. Kitts and Nevis, separate from the current territory Anguilla, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, as well as Trinidad and Tobago in current territories, Cayman Islands, and Turks and Caicos, which were formerly part of the colony of Jamaica and Montserrat. So the Federation lasted a bit over four years from January 1958 to May 1962. So how did this move to a single political unit get started, and what were some of its early stipulations? I just want to clarify that it was a federation. It wasn't a unitary state. So I, I, so a single political unit, I, I just want to be clear that it wasn't a unitary state in the way in which we understand Jamaica to be a unit, a single state. It was a federation which, as with the American Federation, um, tried to find a balance between states' rights and a federal authority. There's nothing particularly unique about the West Indies Federation in that federation was a form of administration that had a fairly long history in the Caribbean, especially in terms of um, the Eastern Caribbean, the Leeward and Windward Islands, where Britain used the federal device primarily as a means of administrative efficiency in the Caribbean. So there was already a federation within the Leeward and Windward Islands, which were dissolved for those states to enter into the West Indies Federation. But more broadly speaking, it was a, a colonial device to try to find constitutional forms for colonies that were moving to independence. In the Caribbean, you had the Dutch Antilles Federation, which was the federation of the Dutch territories in the Caribbean as part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands Antilles, and that dissolved in 2010. So it started in 1953 and it ended in 1963. So that 50s period was also a period, certainly within the British administration, of trying to find these forms. So it's not to say that there wasn't support. There was support in the Caribbean, you know, different um, constituencies, for that form of government, because it was presented as the main route through which these small territories could become independent. So that all fell apart once it was clear Jamaica was given the assurance that it could get independence on its own outside of the Federation. So Jamaica's response to that um, with the agitation by the, the Bustamante, um, the GLP, against the Federation, gives you an idea that maybe the, the dream of a Federation wasn't that, you know, well, certainly in terms of Jamaica, um, wasn't that embedded, but it was seen as a, a tool of convenience. Some of the fault lines that also led to the collapse of the Federation were issues of taxation. So they're right at the start, there were some, some serious issues that were not easily resolved. Who was going to control taxes? The territories wanted control over taxes and were reluctant to give up taxation powers to the federal government. So the 
Federation started with Outer Customs Union. It's as if Montego Bay had its own system for imposing taxes when shipments, you know, offload goods than the rest of Jamaica. So the other thing that was problematic, and those weren't the only things, but were, those were two of the key things, was the whole question of movement within the Federation with the Eastern Caribbean islands being seen as particularly problematic to Trinidad uh, because there had been movement, migrations into Trinidad with the opening of the oil fields in search of work. So there's a feeling that Trinidad would be swamped by these islands. So that, again, was one issue that was left postponed for five years. So all of these thorny issues. So you started what is supposed to be, you know, a new government, a new, a new territory, and a, a new um, political constituency with its members not being able to cross borders. So it had these defects right from the start. There's also the sentiment, the feeling that the Eastern Caribbean would be a burden, the smallest units would be a burden on the, the, the larger territories, the one with clear resources. So there was that, you know, imbalance in terms of we're not really equal units, but we have some units that were better able to thrive and some that would be dependent. And the British didn't help because they were not guaranteeing any rail funds to support the development of of these islands. So it started with a lot of contradictions and tensions. So it's not really surprising that it didn't last beyond four years. The fifth year was you're expected to have resolved all of these things. And that would have been a point of reckoning, the extent to which people really wanted to invest in what they saw as, you know, something that had its problematic elements. One thing that I also want to bring out is the fact that under this federation, which was brought on by the British Caribbean Federation Act of 1956, this move to towards independence also would still require the queen to be the head of state. There would still be a governor general, much like we have now. And then there would be a single prime minister elected by their house of representatives. I guess my question to you then is, what is that question of, of independence look like when the queen is still required to be the head of state? Um, and I guess, as you briefly brought up, what were sort of the shortcomings on Britain's behalf to not, you know, allow for the Federation to sort of succeed in the best way possible? Thanks for bringing that up, because what I should have said is that independence was delayed. So when the Federation came into being in 1958, it was still a colony. It wasn't a, a federation. It wasn't an independent state. Independence was supposed to um, come five years later. So. Part of the problem is that you already had places like Jamaica that were far more advanced on the road to self-government and independence than other territories and felt that they were being held back. In terms of the Queen, I mean, the Queen and Governor General are structures that we, we have brought with us into independence. And those are seen as you know, ceremonial rather than having any real constitutional value. Although in the case of the Grenada invasion, one of the arguments was that the only legitimate source of authority was the governor general who was appointed by the queen. And of course, that was a controversial proposition. So that in itself wasn't, is necessarily a problem. But the problem would have been all of those issues. I mean, people have gone into the politics of it to look at the, the, how the politics around the Federation was, was um, constructed or how it developed. The fact that Norman Manley, who had lots of respect, a lot of respect from the Eastern Caribbean, most of the other Caribbean islands, and would have wanted to see him lead the, the Federation, um, put his, his efforts into the Jamaican um, national scene, which in a sense suggested from even then that Jamaica was more important, the national was more important than the regional as a, as a political arena. I mean, I think the intricate thing is that on 
one half, there were so many of these issues that, that you brought up, but there were also several important services um, and things that were brought up to the region. So I think most notably the expansion of what is now um, UWE, the University of the West Indies, right? And so could you talk a bit about some of those pros and how they added to what we now know as the Caribbean region? Yes, the University of the West Indies is one of the lasting institutions that came out of the Federation. But I I also want to to mention a couple that most of us don't really know about. Um, The common currency became the Eastern Caribbean dollar, and it's used by the, the OECS states. The mechanism, the legal judicial system was also something that the Eastern Caribbean inherited. So there were these closest forms of of integration remained with and were embraced by the Eastern Caribbean states and continue to this day. Shortly after the Federation collapsed, the whole question of, of Caribbean viability and the small size of the individual territories, even Jamaica, made the prospect of pooling resources something that you know appeared desirable for Jamaica and Trinidad in particular it was about getting markets for their goods so that was an important um, impetus to continue an arrangement the idea being that the regional market was an easier market to penetrate to sell goods than you know other markets so that you know generated an interest in regional integration. The fact, as you said, that there were a few st- shared services coming out of the federation also uh, contributed to the feeling that you know, especially given the small size, the whole question of administrative efficiency was one of the arguments that you know popularized for integration as well. So that developed into cooperation on other aspects of education, health, you know, meteorology and and civil aviation. And the Caribbean Development Bank, which is not a CARICOM institution, but developed alongside the regional process as a means of of, um, providing development finance, was also an important element of you know, one of the institutions that really support the regional process. One thing that I've heard from elders, um, you know, talking to, I guess, the youth today, right, is that the islands were, quote unquote, better off um, before independence. And I've heard, I've heard both and not as well. So it can go either way. Um, But I think in terms of, you know, at the time of the Federation, what was sort of the local reaction. You talked a bit about Jamaica um, and Manly's push towards a sort of more nationalistic realm, but what was um, some of that general response look like? And I don't think that people are hankering after independence because they thought that things were so great. (laughs) And whenever you hear people talk about it being better, then you have to ask yourself for whom, you know? So, I mean, it's okay in the comfort of having had years of being uh, of relative self-governance. And I don't want to make too many claims of sovereignty because ours has been a compromised sovereignty from the start, uh, probably more than most. But I don't think that you can, you can just ignore the sense of confidence, the sense of self that we have grown up with and taken for granted for having people who look like us in positions of leadership. And that doesn't mean that we don't hold them to account and probably, you know, even to a higher standard than the colonial British regime. But at the same time, I don't know who wants to go back to being a colony of Britain. So I really don't understand where the notion, I mean, if you go back, and I don't have Jamaica statistics, but I think that you would see that 
the levels of access to education are much lower, access to healthcare as rudimentary as our healthcare systems are, I don't think that the majority of the population had access to quality health care, you know, mm-hmm. education. So I I think that maybe the generation you're speaking to, maybe it's like, you know, all the people always think things were so much better in the olden days. And, and you know, people were far more respectful, children were far more respectful and, you know, and a lot of that is is a myth. So the past always looks rosier than the present. No, I definitely agree with that. Um, so talking more about the Federation's demise, we talked about some things that, you know, led to the demise, namely the taxes. Also, there was a question of where the capital would be. That is somewhat of a more so complicated issue where, um, the, one of the original points was a U.S. foothold at the time, and so there was a question of whether the Caribbean would get ownership, and then it became part of Spain as a result as sort of a temporary fix. A number of ones that we've also mentioned throughout the podcast um, today, do you think some of these problems um, could have been resolved? Maybe not the question of the capital per se, but um, what was sort of the cost and the impact of some of these decisions and ultimately the demise of the Federation? One of the things I didn't mention was the relative lack of awareness that people had of one another. Um, Jamaica in particular did not have much uh, much experience looking south. And so the Eastern Caribbean was mostly unknown. I was just reading through a collection by Hall and Chokasang, bringing together speeches um, of prime ministers, you know, throughout Caribbean's years. And one of the first meetings right after, shortly after the collapse of the Federation, where they were discussing cooperation beyond the Federation, Bustamante basically said, we don't really know you, you know? He was very happy for the hospitality. He seemed to be particularly enamored with um, Janet Jagan in Ghana, but he basically said, you know, to be honest, I don't really know you guys. So. I think that that was also part of it. It's not as if you know there's that much movement. There, were, there was far more movement in the Eastern Caribbean, not, not that much. And you see the Golden Report, Jamaica's commission on, I don't quite remember the formal name, but exploring Jamaica's membership in CARICOM, which was done a few years ago. One of the recommendations was to explore the Northern Caribbean, I mean, so there's always this sense that Jamaica felt its interest was more towards the Northern Caribbean than the Southern Caribbean. So that, that's a very important element of it. Look, you lose things and you gain things in this situation. I remember when I was doing my research, trying to understand why Antigua was not interested in a union, a political union with other Windward and um, Leeward Islands, other OECS member states. And their Bert Senior, in one of his speeches against the union, had said, you don't want Eugenia Charles telling us to put a, a toilet there. And there was another reference I came across where he was saying that under the Federation, no, I can't say whether this is true or not, Antigua is supposed to be a place to raise cattle. You know, the ambitions for Antigua were not very high. Now, Antigua has one of the highest per capita GDPs um, in the Caribbean, a thriving, if not unproblematic, um, tourism sector, services sector. So I think Mm -hmm. there's a sense in which if you have to balance resources of one country, where would you put airports? You know, you already had airports in Jamaica and Barbados. You wouldn't be, be putting airports in Grenada. At Independence, most of the islands of the Eastern Caribbean did not have 
international airports. And one of the big sticking points of the Grenada Revolution and its relationship with Cuba for the U.S. was the Cuban support with other countries. But that was seen as particularly problematic to help Grenada to construct an international airport. Venezuela recently helped St. Vincent to construct an international airport. So these, these are very interesting things that, that we forget that one could argue that in terms of autonomy, in terms of a vision for what is possible on an island like Grenada to 100,000 people or of Antigua with around 70,000 people, in the broad scheme of things, those would be backwaters, even in a small federation as the West Indies Federation. At the same time, though, what we stand to lose is developing a sense of what we have in common and what we need to fight for. And a lot of the of CARICOM and what we discuss have to do with how to enlarge markets. But an important part, although it's not as well developed as it should be, is how to give the Caribbean a voice in international fora. And we see this with CARICOM trying to find a, a way to resist the imposition of European tax regimes controlling you know, financial regulation on the Caribbean. So, but that is one of the aspects of CARICOM that is probably least developed and most contentious. Uh, we see it with, with the breakdown of uh, solidarity over Venezuela with the U.S. government under Trump and Pompeo siphoning, siphoning off a few countries, Jamaica being prime among them, to try to break down the Caribbean solidarity on Venezuela and on U.S. intervention. So uh, you have the Caribbean being ignored in the context of Haiti, even though Haiti is a member of CARICOM. So there are very important arenas, for example, protecting our natural resources or extractive sectors where Ghana has is now doing commercial or allowing the commercial exploitation of oil, but outside of any CARICOM framework or regional framework governing, you know, setting on basic standards of ownership of how to maintain, you know, protections for the environment. You know, there's still a huge role for a regional organization to play in areas like those that I think the region is really lacking, dragging behind. Also, something that I think that more can be done, that, that question of movement across the region is still one that's, that's, that's very problematic because even in the context of CARICOM and a more expansive approach to movement, that movement is still within the framework of who is desirable, who is a desirable person to move versus who is not. So if you're skilled and you're seen as worthwhile, you're seen as contributing to a regional e economy, if you're not skilled, whatever that means, you are not covered. You don't have that, that right. The, the OECS has moved beyond where CARICOM is by opening up freedom of movement in that way. But there's an important role for strengthening Caribbean people's sense of belonging, you know, in a world where the Caribbean is becoming more and more marginalized. I mean, people, people don't usually flood to places where they can't make a living, you know. So I think that, that there are some missed opportunities there. Shifting sort of more to the history. So after the demise of the West Indian Federation, um, you get the Caribbean Free Trade Association, which then also eventually sort of evolves or not necessarily evolves, but then that's where you get CARICOM um, subsequently after the Caribbean Free Trade Association. So could you talk a bit about what that change was like? Um, what exactly is CARICOM? Because I think some people don't necessarily know and sort of how do the goals differ from maybe what the Federation entailed? 
I, I don't think we need pause too long on character. Character was a brief stop on the road with a, a small number of countries and where it was supposed to, supposed to be a free trade area. So it was focused just on trade. The Eastern Caribbean islands were not very happy with just focusing on trade. They wanted, you know, different arrangements that that focus more on their their special challenges access to finance especially developmental finance and out of that push the Caribbean Development Bank uh, was born the shift from Carifta to CARICOM was also you know fueled by the shift when Britain decided to join was finally, sorry, admitted to the European Union and the question of what its relationship um, with its still dependent Caribbean colonies and would be with the European Union, which gave the smaller territories, Eastern Caribbean territories, some greater leverage in pushing for, you know, different mechanisms in a broader framework that would address their concerns more. It CARICOM, first off, it's a community of independent states, whereas the Federation was supposed to have led to one federally integrated state where you recognize the rights of the, the individual units. They had certain autonomy, you know, they had certain ability to tax, to collect certain, some taxes over development strategies so within limits have its own slate of governing responsibilities caricom doesn't have that federal structure so caricom is dominated largely by the heads of governments who meet and discuss the direction that the movement would take so you have the the caricom heads of government and then you have different organs under that so you have for example councils on health finance trade and you know so social issues so you so you have these different bodies that discuss you know more sector or interest related uh, matters but the main difference is that these are sovereign states and the integration process does not go very far unless there's agreement among them. So CARICOM basically operates on the four main main areas of, um, they call them the pillars. So there is economic integration, and we'll come back to that. There is functional cooperation, which covers what you are talking about, education, health, and so on. Then you have international relations, of foreign affairs, really, foreign affairs, and a more recent one, security cooperation. So those are the the four areas of cooperation that CARICOM has. Most of the focus has been on the CARICOM single market and economy. And just to stick up in here, not all members of CARICOM are members of the CARICOM single market and economy. The Bahamas is not and has never been part of any of the economic arrangements of CARICOM, but they're part of the functional arrangements. Montserrat, which is still a British territory, doesn't participate in the economic elements, but in the functional elements. CARICOM's observer territories, territories that are not independent. Right now, the uh, English-speaking territories are not part of the economic arrangements but part of the functional arrangements. And Haiti, since it it has joined the organization, has not implemented or become, you know, part of the CSME. But in principle, it's supposed to be a part of the CSME. And what the CSME is intending to do is to create a regional marketplace. So uh, more than that, a regional productive place where you remove um, inhibitions to people, regulations that inhibit companies from setting up in other Caribbean territories, removing financial control so that if you earn your money in Jamaica, 
you can repatriate it to Trinidad so that currency can move freely, a place where people can trade services more freely. So ultimately, the, the aim is to remove those barriers to people trading in goods and services. It also aims to harmonize and removing these barriers is not an easy task because there are lots of, you know, regulations within different countries, each country that need to be removed. The next step is harmonizing policy across, you know, all the the, the different sectors. That has been proving to be difficult because and the CSME was signed in 2006. The recession started in 2008. The Caribbean also in 2008 negotiated the economic partnership agreement with the EU, um, which has its own regulatory challenges, its own institutions to set up. And, you know, so there's a lot why countries are individually trying to dig themselves out of an economic hole. And then, of course, you have COVID. So that progress has been very difficult, but it takes up a lot of the oxygen when we talk about CARICOM and when we think that CARICOM is not working. Most of it is focused on trade. And I have my my little hobby horse when it comes to trade because if you're not producing, then, you know, trade and opening barriers to trade is not enough. And I, I think that we haven't paid enough attention to how we can produce and how we can produce goods as a region, as opposed to how we can trade. And this is, you know, coming from the Eastern Caribbean in particular, which doesn't have large firms. That's a concern that, you know, I share. So with that, then, what are your thoughts or um, hopes for, you know, the future of regional integration, um, maybe even independence for some of those territories that are not independent currently? Let's start with the countries that are not independent currently. I think given the experience of independence, that it's very difficult. It's very difficult to expect very tiny territories, although you do have some in, in Pacific, to exist as, you know, independent states. And I understand the reluctance to become independent, formally independent. If you look at the independent Caribbean states, we're heavily indebted. We're some of the most indebted people, um, countries in the world. You know, we have some of the highest skill migration rates. So I think, you know, that to expect that outside of some kind of regional framework is going to be challenging. The problem is that I don't know that a political union is something that's viable either. I don't think that where the Caribbean is right now, that there is much prospect of that. Although, let me correct myself. Every so often, you have this out of the blue, a constellation of leaders who say, let's think about a political union. So it's not strictly true to say that the appetite for political union doesn't exist. There have been study after study that shows that once the issue is not politicized, people find the idea of, you know, one Caribbean politically to be something attractive. Of course, that varies from country to country, right? So I think that if we can find a way to show how a political arrangement could address a number of things that without it being falling prey to national polarization, that we 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 may be able to have a conversation going. But I think that we cannot be naive to think that a regional state is going to necessarily bring all the things that, you know, we think of. It's not utopia. We still have to talk about violence, how the state use violence, how redistribution happens, you know, who belongs, who has a right to belong, how we create wealth, how we distribute wealth 
if we are going to become or political union is going to be an avenue for our greater exploitation, you know, so that, so that it can be handed over on a platter to the United States or to Exxon or, you know, then I think that that will be deeply problematic. I think we have to think about what we want political union to do, what it is we're dissatisfied with, at the national level that we think can be resolved at a regional level and how a regional state can be different and not replicate the challenges of national states. In other words, are we going to have a larger avenue for the exploitation and marginalization of Caribbean people? Beautifully said. Thank you so much. You've left us with so much to think about. Um, So listeners, be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comments and things. We definitely want to know what you think about um, Dr. Lewis's points here and this discussion of regional integration. So last but not least, my favorite question of all, what are some of your favorite examples of, you know, this history of federation and things in our contemporary or even, you know, not even necessarily contemporary, but in our popular culture? Yeah, what, the only thing I can think about is something that showed what the potential of the region could be that was lost. And it's obviously not my recollection, but people have talked about the federal ships. Canada had given the Federation these three ships as a gift and people were able to just go on the ship and move from island to island and apparently it was an incredible experience and I think that that itself more than any image I have of the federation tells me what was lost that ability to access cheap transportation and just go to another island and see what it's like. Not because you want to work there, not because you want to live there, but because, you know, you just want to see what this this region looks like, you know? But people in the region who have had, you know, the same history as yourself, you know, what they look like, you know, what are their similarities? Um, So I think that knowing of the other in the Caribbean, is something that was lost. Liat, the airlines that ply the Eastern Caribbean that was owned um, primarily by Eastern Caribbean governments. There was a time Liat offered a one month fare where you could stop in a number of islands without paying any extra. And actually that's how I did my PhD research. I wrote to Liat and Biwi asking them, because I I was a a poor graduate student with no funding to do the research, asking them for complimentary tickets. And that Liat ticket to be able to go from Antigua and just travel down the Caribbean doing interviews and doing, using Biwi, you know, to go to Ghana and then making the trek all the way back up to Jamaica was very important. And I know that, you know, even then it was, you know, sufficiently expensive that not a lot of people would have been able to take, you know, advantage of it. But since then, it travel has become so much more expensive in the Caribbean that, you know, that's a loss. And in the Caribbean, and I know they talk about it all of the time, but if they can find a way to, you know, have different modes of transportation across the region to ease access, and, you know, they've been working on that. And the CCG, you know, you one of the advantages of the CSM, you know, is that you should have the right to visit a country and, you know, stay I think it's up to six months without um you know that doesn't give you a right to work but you still need a CARICOM um, permission to work in 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 other countries 
but just to visit, you know, but because of the high cost of travel, you know, it's not really as available to people as one would like. Oyago, stay tuned for Strictly Fact Sounds, where we connect our history to pop culture. In addition to Dr. Lewis's amazing descriptions of the travel and regional connectedness provided by ships, the Federal Palm and the Federal Maple, which were donated by Canada to the West Indian Federation in May 1961, and of course we have more information about them on the Strictly Fact syllabus, did you know that Trinidad and Tobago's national anthem, Forged for the Love of Liberty, was originally called A Song for Federation? It was composed by Patrick S. Castani to be the national anthem of the West Indian Federation, but Castani later repurposed the original song after the Federation's demise. As for some other songs for you to check out, in celebration of the political union, some familiar names to Strictly Fact Sounds composed pieces reflective of the times. Popular Calypsonians Lord Kitchener and Mighty Sparrow both individually composed songs in 1958 entitled Federation, highlighting their excitement at the hopes for this political unity, with Sparrow even remarking, let us join together and love one another, we all is one. However, after the Federation collapsed, Mighty Sparrow composed another song of the same name in 1962 to describe some of the reasons why the Federation fell apart. And lastly, one of my personal favorites, Jamaican writer, performer, and activist Louise Bennett published poems like Big Woods and Dear Departed Federation that describe some of the issues within the Federation and the effects of its demise. So check out all of these songs for a little musical history. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis, for sharing with us both about this history and of your own personal story as well. Listeners, thank you for listening and all of this information, as well as the Strictly Facts syllabus you can find online, which will provide you all more information um, and links to other research and different books and things when you want to check out more of this information. So we hope you all enjoyed listening to this episode a little more. Thanks for tuning in to Strictly Facts. Visit strictlyfactspodcast.com for more information from each episode. Follow us at Strictly Facts Pod on Instagram and Facebook and at Strictly Facts PD on Twitter.